Well, as we look at the, the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, the communion table today, we're going to take a look at feet. Now, most people don't think of feet as being beautiful. We're not going to have a show and tell, because most people just don't have beautiful feet. Maybe you have, do you have beautiful feet? Okay. That's probably subjective. But feet show up in the Bible a lot. Um, and so we're going to look at feet. Not really, but... John chapter 13 is where we'll be looking at in Scripture today. And um, so as you're turning there, let me go ahead and have a word of prayer, a few moments of silent prayer so that there's any unconfessed sin. Uh, you can deal with that, in the privacy of your own mind and heart. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for life, the physical life that we have. There's a purpose in it. You have us breathing for a reason. We don't always understand your plan, but we trust that it is perfect. Give us the strength and courage to make it through each day. Lord, sometimes we need that courage just for one moment to the next. But we know that you are there, that you are ever present, that you will give us everything that we need. Uh, Lord, uh, we just, today as we focus on the sacrifice of your Son, our Lord and Savior, may we be mindful of what that means to us personally, um, and may we then take this truth and not keep it hidden, but proclaim it with our lives and with our lips to those who are around us. We thank you for all that you've done for us, and it's in your Son's name we pray these things. Amen. I think I am going to go ahead and flip that. So John chapter 13, a pretty familiar story. Um, it's about the washing of feet. Makes perfect sense. So starting in verse 1, Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. I mean, it's a pretty staggering uh, statement um, that, you know, that the devil had already made his plans, um, but God also had his plans. And uh, we know the scene pretty well. The disciples have gathered together. Um, the t disciples weren't always very quick in picking things up, uh, but this was going to be one of their last times with him. It certainly is why we call it the Last Supper. And I don't think many, if any of them, really got the gravity, grasped the gravity of what was going on. And so it continues in verse 4, He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So he takes on the posture of a servant. And that had to have been a little bit shocking uh, to the disciples, and it, and it was. So he came to Simon Peter in verse 6, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. That's such a Peter answer, isn't it? It's like, No, Lord, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. 
So there's a lot going on there, and, and often Jesus would speak in these terms that weren't maybe completely clear up front, because he wanted his disciples to think and to ask questions, but they made assumptions, wrong ones, often, as they do here. So you have this amazing conversation between Peter and Jesus. Jesus is washing his feet. Peter's thinking about the here and now, and Jesus is thinking about and speaking about the eternal. And Peter has not connected the dots. And so when Peter says, okay, Lord, you can't wash my feet, because that's what a servant would do, there's no way I could possibly ask you to, to do something like that. And this is a, just a beautiful example, one of many we have in Scripture, of the servant Savior, Jesus as servant of the world, that he would serve us. We, in turn, should serve him um, because of his love for us. And Jesus says to Peter in verse 8, the end, last part of it, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Peter's not quite getting it, and so he's like, okay, fine. Then if you, I, I don't know if Jesus wanted to slap Peter at this point, but I would have been <laughs> tempted to. It's like, well, fine, if you're going to wash my feet, then why don't you just do my head and my hands as well? Let's just do the full combo uh, package here. And so then Jesus in verse 10 said, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. This is an important passage for many reasons. One, there are those who say that when Peter denied Christ, there's no way he could have been a Christian. But Jesus is saying that he is a Christian at this point. He's saying that the one who has bathed, in other, one, in other words, because remember we go back to John 3 when Jesus is having that conversation with Nicodemus. And... Uh, you know, and so we know that what Jesus is talking about here when he says, you've already been cleaned. I've already forgiven you your sin. You've already put your faith and trust in me as the Messiah. Um, and since you've already bathed, you've been cleansed through salvation. The only thing you need to do is wash your feet. In other words, when you sin, when you stumble, then take care of that. That's the only thing you need to clean, Peter. The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. That's a really cool thing. Completely clean. We can't do anything more. It's already been done. It's been completely, thoroughly accomplished by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So when later Jesus would say, it is finished, he meant it. There was no more work for him to do, and there was no work for us to do other than to put our faith and trust in him. The last part of verse 10, and you are clean, but not every one of you. So who's Jesus referring to that's not clean? Well, Judas. And we know that Judas was not saved, was not a believer in the Messiah, um, because of what we read a little bit later. Verse 11, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. Verse 12, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash another's feet. So he's saying, look, if, if I, as your Lord... <laughs> and rabbi, teacher, if I've humbled myself to this position of servanthood, then do the same. Remember, their system of religious uh, ritual and all the rest of it was, uh, was, uh, was really about, uh, you know, people being, you being better than everybody else. Remember the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan um, and how there were individuals that should have known better but didn't and walked by the guy who was in need. And Jesus is reminding them that, you know, when he, when he asked questions, well, who is your neighbor? In the Jewish tradition, your neighbor was a fellow Jewish person that you knew, um, but it didn't include the Gentiles because they're a bunch of dirty, filthy people. And Jesus is saying, yeah, but I've washed them too. Um, 
So you also ought to wash one another, another's feet. For I have given you an example, verse 15, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Ooh, that's like application. Great if you know it, but the blessing is going to come only if you apply it, if you actually live this out. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. So Jesus is continually giving these clues as to who he is. It's like, if you have any doubt, disciples, I'm going to give you another clue. Now, on the cross and the resurrection, they're going to get a enormous. Hu That's not a word. They're going to get a huge clue. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I find that interesting because that phrase heel kind of echoes in Genesis chapter 3 when we have the first messianic prophecy. And if you recall, then God is letting Adam and Eve and humanity know that, all right, Satan is going to bruise the heel, but I'm going to crush his head. Injuring your heel, if you've ever done that, it's, it can be painful and it's difficult because we use our feet a lot. Um, kind of hard to get anywhere without them. And, uh, but that will, you can recover from that. Uh, your head being crushed, not so easy to recover from. And um, so there's kind of a, 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 an echo of that language from Genesis 3. Verse 20, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying uh, these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. And you can imagine what they're doing. It's like, oh, do you, think it's, do you think it's Bartholomew? I don't know. I never trusted that guy. He looks kind of weird. And who names their kid Bartholomew? But then the disciples, in verse 22, looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke, and one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, so John, was reclining at table at Jesus' side. So Simon Peter mentioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. Now, I don't know why Peter didn't ask Jesus himself, but it's like, hey, John, ask, you know, ask Jesus for me. Probably because John's right next to him, and John is kind of the favorite. It's like my little brother growing up. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. And that's where we know Judas was not a believer. Uh, certainly at, least at this point, because believers cannot be possessed by Satan. Can't happen. Cannot be possessed by a demon either. Now, we can be influenced, or some people call it oppression, but uh, believers cannot be in, they cannot have Satan in them, contrary to what you might think about your spouse from time to time. So Satan entered into him, and Jesus said to him, what you are going to do do quickly. Get it over with. You know what you're going to do, so do it. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. So, if we reread those verses, we would have several um, examples of feet <laughs> and what the feet were like. So the disciples came to Jesus. They came to this room. 
um, with feet that were possibly tired, sore, maybe bruised, definitely dirty um, as they're you know, walking through the dust and all the rest um, in the ancient times, of course, wearing sandals. And that was the whole point of the foot washing anyway, uh, to begin with, was that uh, when you came to somebody's house, um, if they were a gracious individual and uh, followed tradition, then they would, your feet would be washed. The servant would wash your feet. And so that's why to them it was very odd that Jesus was the one washing their feet. And because, uh, you know, there's nothing worse than grody, dirty feet, except somebody else's dirty, grody feet. But they left that room with feet that would do several things, feet that would betray. Judas used his feet to go to the temple to get his money and betray the Messiah. A few chapters later, Peter would deny Jesus. In chapter 18, verses 15 through 19, um, and not just, in fact, I think I've Forgot to add some other verses there, but you can find it in that chapter in any event. But, you know, Peter would deny Christ. And then, of course, you have the disciples on a couple of occasions that would hide. And after he had been crucified, they hid, they locked themselves in a room, uh, fearful of what the Jews were going to do to them at that point. And so we see that feet accomplish a lot of different things. Jesus used his own feet to walk to his death, to climb up Calvary and be placed on a cross. But notice that Jesus didn't ask us to follow him to the cross, but rather he wants us to walk in his footsteps. He wants to follow his example of being the servant savior. So just before we begin passing the elements here, maybe just a question to ponder is, where is he asking you to walk today? Because now he wants us, well, as always, he doesn't want our feet to deny him, to betray him, uh, to hide from him. We can go back to that Genesis 3 passage where Adam and Eve were trying to hide. And yet he knew where they were, but he wanted to know why they were where they were. And sometimes we still try to hide from Jesus. We still hide, try to hide from God. So what do you, where is he asking you to walk today? Is he asking you to go somewhere in life that you don't want to go? Um, are you going through something right now that you don't want to be going through, that you didn't think you'd have to, or you thought you'd have more time? I don't know. But know this, that he is always walking with you. And he's faithful to us even when we are not faithful to him. Just a reminder quickly of communion at Evergreen. A couple of things. One, it's open communion. So if you are, you do not have to be a member of Evergreen Baptist Church to participate in communion this morning. You do have to be a member of the family of God. And that's only by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. That is key. That is important. For those of us who have believed in Jesus Christ as our Savior and are going to participate in communion this morning, we do need to be in fellowship. In other words, no unconfessed sin in your life. We all know 1 John 1, 9 pretty well. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so we need to come before this ceremony, this service, with a clean heart. Does that mean that you're perfect? No, because then none of us would participate. Um, but we do need to have taken care of business with the Lord. And you'll have moments while the plates are being passed to talk to the Lord, to confess any sin that needs to be confessed, uh, to thank him for his sacrifice, uh, to remember what he has done for us. So, with that, I'll have the uh, deacons assemble.